about to stream. Hello everybody, I'm Anila. Thanks for joining us. We're gonna be live streaming this webinar. So please um, make sure that you share it with your friends as well and learn what you can from a COVID update that we're gonna be providing with our two experts here. I'm Anila Ali and it's a pleasure to have all of you. We have two experts, two amazing frontline heroes. One is our board member, Dr. Sabine Munib, and the other one is Dr. Puneet Chahal and we'll be welcoming them in a minute. I just want to share that we are going to be having a very important event. It is going to be a discussion with the renowned writer, author, expert on Abrahamic faith, and his name is Raza Islan. Um, but what's really exciting is that for Hajj Eid, we're gonna be giving out 50 of his books signed by Raza. And so the first 50 people to register for our webinar um, are going to get this for free. Um, and I disclaimer, it's only for the United States. I know we have a lot of people joining us from the rest of the world, but uh, this is um, only for the people living in the US because it's going to be hard for us to mail it anywhere else. Um, so please join us. It's on Tuesday, August 4th at 4 p.m. And we're going to be um, showing it live on Facebook on, on our page. So without further ado, I'm going to welcome uh, my uh, AMBEC board member, um, Dr. Sabine Munib. She's been uh, updating us uh, frequently, and she's our board member. She's a frontline hero, and we thank her for her service. And uh, we're also joined by Dr. Puneet Chahal, and um, I'll pass the bit on, on to Dr. Sabine to introduce her and tell us um, what we need to know about COVID and the updates as we stand today. Okay. All right. So thank you, Anila. Uh, I have a question. Do the board members qualify for the book? I need the book. <laughs> you know, <laughs> most definitely. If you can dedicate one hour of your precious time, you got it. All right. Thank you so much. Hello, everybody. So um, welcome back. I'm Dr. Sabine Munib. I'm one of the doctors um, uh, um, and a board member on MVAC. Um, so I'm not the expert today. I had the expert of experts today, Dr. Chahal. She is infectious disease specialist. Um, uh, she has been in practice uh, in Orange County since past, uh, I think it's over 10 years, right, uh, Dr. Chahal? Yeah. And yeah. her practice is uh, uh, IDAOC, and uh, she has a very busy practice, and we thank her for taking time for us. Um, it's very interesting. Um, we were talking about how, you know, we are the frontline runners, frontline workers, how much uh, dedicated we are. So we are all, you know, we feel like, okay, so we are pushed to our limits, you know, at times. But, you know, uh, yesterday when I, um, I was laying down in bed, I, I was about to uh, go to sleep with my daughter. Um, I received a call from Dr. Shahal and it was nine, I think it was nine or 9.30. And she was coming back Probably. from the hospital. And, yeah. you know, and then I thought, oh, she is she is the, the really, really dedicated <laughs> frontline worker, you know. So, and my daughter was like, mommy, who's that? And I'm like, that's her friend. Oh, she's not sleeping. Um, I'm like, no, she's not sleeping. She is smart. <laughs> so thank you so much uh, for being there. And I text you a lot. She's a very good friend of mine um, and a very good physician. So. Um, Dr. Shahal, why don't you introduce yourself? Okay. Hello, everyone, and uh, thank you. Thank you, Sabine. Uh, really uh, enjoy, always enjoy texting with you and talking with you anytime. Thank you for having me, Anila. Uh, so I'm, uh, you know, this 
is sort of uh, unusually busy for an infectious disease physician. So we, we're, we're consultant physicians who deal with infections and, you know, your every day. And then in the starting uh, early January and then ending up in March, we have been really, really thrown into this uh, sort of hurricane of of this new coronavirus. So dealing with it now for the last several months, uh, it has become sort of routine, which is also a bit unfortunate that it has become routine and we, we know we'll have to deal with it. But, uh, you know, every day is, is it is um, getting tiresome. It does get, get a bit, but then you have to keep going. We have to keep going. We have to do, you know, what we signed up for. <laughs> yeah. All right, so a few updates before we start asking you questions. This is one, this is like a very informal talk. Um, we have some questions which um, some of our listeners sure. have already sent. Um, so um, I just took this data out of, uh, uh, you know, from CDC, uh, which is, you know, just a brief update. So um, today, um, 60,000 uh, new cases were reported in the United States. Uh, total uh, cases for corona is 4.3 million. Total deaths is 1,148,000 deaths. Um, total cases in California is 466,550 and Orange County is 35,000, which just Dr. Chahal just updated me with regards to Orange County. That's where we are. Mm -hmm. um, and um, I just wanted to bring up this number um, for healthcare uh, providers, total reported deaths is 572. So, um, I mean, it is important, yes, um, for us all to know, like, yes, there are reported deaths, there are deaths reported in seniors, but there are other people who are also dying because of the, this disease and healthcare professionals, you know, they're not spared. Um, it's unfortunate, but this is the reality of um, COVID um, that we are dealing with. So, um, Dr. Chahal, why don't you tell us about your day? How do you start your day and how are you able to stay COVID free till now? <laughs> <laughs> that, that is a, that that's a very good question and it's always a blessing every day to remain healthy these days um you know it's uh, the most of my work is now only dealing with covid patients but mostly they are serious patients who are in the hospital for a while um, I don't see a lot of patients uh, in the office anymore because of that. So it does require a lot of care, a lot of meticulous care to put on our, you know, three layers of protection, the mask, the N95 mask, the other mask, shields, gowns, you know, caps. So many, many pro uh, sort of procedures are done to protect ourselves. And the same thing happens when we take everything off because it's contaminated. We have to be really careful. So it does take way longer. It takes a long time to do the same tasks, you know, to make sure that you're protecting yourself and also taking care of patients at the same time. Uh, so it definitely does, you know, every day becomes a little, you know, when we started doing this, when we started in March, every day was, was a little bit of like, we're going into the lion's den. Like, how am I going to survive this? Is this going to go on forever? And then as time goes on, you know, humans adapt and we adapted to this and this has become a routine. So procedures are in place to protect healthcare workers, you know, and if we have enough of those, if we have enough of those protective equipment, the PPE, uh, it is possible to protect yourself and to follow those procedures. But it definitely takes a toll on your mental health because you're constantly worried for yourself and your family. You know, that's that does not go away. We just we just have to adapt to it. Mm -hmm. So, what do you do um, as a healthcare provider? Yes, you 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 are using all the um, protective equipment and um, PPEs. So, when you come back home, what kind of measures do you take? So, you know, just to um, um, help your family members, um, you know, prevent this infection, so you don't transfer it to your family members. What what kind of um, protective measures or precautions do you take when you get back home at nine o'clock? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, hopefully not, not nine o'clock each day. Yes, I do try to be back on time. I have a very supportive uh, family. My daughter and my husband are kind of well aware that this is going to be life for a few months. Um, you know, it's sort of, it's 
like a, the same process that we use in the hospital. The moment I leave the hospital, I take off all the equipment that I've been wearing carefully. I, you know, I clean my hands and, and so forth. I clean my car that I'm sitting on, the seat I'm sitting on. And then when I get out of my car, you know, the garage has an old area where I am basically decontaminating there, take off my shoes, my clothes that I wore in the hospital. It's everything is out in the garage and I'm like running to the shower. <laughs> <laughs> cleaning up and you know just and initially actually I did wear a mask at home um, because we know the masks really work so I was concerned that if I'm infected and I don't know because initially I might not know for a few days uh, so I was doing that for a while and you know over time I realized that I'm, I'm doing a good job uh, preventing myself from getting it so hopefully transmitting it so it's also you know it's protecting myself and then making sure I don't bring something in the house that has been with me in the hospital, like my phone or my keys, everything is wiped down. I have a station right in the garage doing that. And it's like a constant, now it's like a routine. I can't, I probably will go to somebody's house, you know, whenever I am able to, I'll probably be doing the same thing. <laughs> like where's your decontamination unit <laughs> to clean up first? Mm -hmm. yeah, good thing that you mentioned keys and telephones. A lot of time we are negligent. We are, you know, it, 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 it never comes to your mind that, you know, you have to clean those too when you get back in. And especially, you know, a lot of um, healthcare providers or um, healthcare workers who are actually watching this, um, they, they, they do get this idea, like what, what else can be done. And it's a good idea to leave your um, stuff all out there in garage and then, or somewhere, you know, where you can um, leave it and then, you know, enter the house. Uh, so, um, Talking about the mask, uh, how much protective um, is mask? Um, I mean, there we keep on hearing in, the, in news or you know, in, uh, on media, social media, it's all over that mask, you know, there's no difference if you wear a mask, if you don't wear a mask, um, how much protective it is? You know, it is one of the most important things we can do right now. We don't have good medical therapies. We've gotten better at treating this. Our survival rates are getting better. I'm seeing patients are doing better. But when I see something as simple as a mask that can prevent you from getting this, why not use that, that treatment? That's like an, that is like a treatment for me. It's non-pharmacological. You're not taking a medicine. All you have to do is wear a mask. So the decrease is not only that you know, when you wear it, you decrease the chance of spreading it, you also decrease the chance of getting it because you're wearing a mask. Plus, if everybody around you is wearing a mask, those chances go down. So the decrease is, is exponential. You know, if, if two people are standing talking wearing a mask, and even if they're close than, closer than six feet, the chances are like 5% maybe. But if they're not, then you know, your chances go up to 60, 70% of, of getting uh, the same virus. So it's, it is extremely important. It's a simple thing to do. And unfortunately, you know, it's become an issue where it is not an issue in other countries where things are much better controlled. I feel that has been followed, um, you know, by the population very well. So as we go outside uh, for our work or schools or, um, you know, um, just in general, when we go out, so uh, what precautionary measures should everybody be taking? I know uh, healthcare professionals is a little bit different, but... Um, a mask and what else should we um, um, what uh, what else should we do um, I mean gloves wearing gloves hand sanitizers uh, what would you recommend so yeah so the most important thing is when you're uh, you know talking about just going to the grocery store or stores you're wearing your mask and a hand sanitizer is very important regarding gloves it is you know there's a lot of people who feel like a sense of security with gloves on that I'm protecting myself, but look at it, the gloves become your hands then. So you're touching everything with your gloves and you're touching your face and you're adjusting your mask and now your gloves are contaminated and that plastic is holding onto the wires longer. So then your hands. So I say, you know, you got your mask on, you take hand sanitizer, you keep cleaning your hands. Uh, even if you're in the store and you've touched things, you know, as long as your hands are clean with sanitizer or washing them, uh, it is a big, big you know, help with not getting sick. It's, it's in, any, in any disease at all, but especially here. But putting on gloves and walking around, sometimes you know, it is a false sense of security. So I don't think it's that important. 
unless you're going to touch something that's you know contaminated and then you're going to immediately remove the gloves and throw them you, know, you cannot be using the same gloves like throughout the store and then in your car and so forth um, but that part is you know for grocery stores and stores but I think a lot um, of new uh, issues will arise now that schools are opening and I, I, I'm uh, you know that's a whole other area of what to do there yeah mm -hmm. right right yep we have a big big uh you know a questionnaire on <laughs> school opening and i'm what sure i'm do. sure so <laughs> briefly right here He's yeah there. and school teacher is right there right <laughs> Oh, yes. So I, yes, I, I understand. Yes. Um, yeah, I know. And I'm a parent of a 12 year old and, you know, uh, as much as I know, and I've, we've talked about this, Sabine, like as much as, as we want our kids out of the house and in schools, nothing better for a child to be in school. I agree a hundred percent, but you know, we're in a situation that has never happened before. Mm -hmm. We haven't dealt with a pandemic like mm -hmm. this, especially like this. And it affects children now the question is you know does it affect children as much as adults less and so forth and that is being debated as you know what happened when things closed down when they started and everything was shut our kids were locked up inside the homes we don't know what's going to happen when they go back to school so it's a little bit unknown so mm -hmm. far from other countries that try to open schools like korea we've seen some studies and you know they show that elementary school kids less than 10 uh, they don't spread the virus as easily. They don't get the virus as easily. They don't spread it to adults specifically. So that's a good thing. But the 10 to 19 kind of like the age group, the preteens and the teens, they're pretty much, you know, getting it and spreading it like adults. But I agree they're not getting as sick from it. You know, of course, the we always have like a very, uh, I know I hate to use the word, but we're, we have to look at it as statistics. And basically that's what we're looking at. Like, okay, kids are getting it, but they're not really dying from it. They're doing well, they're doing okay. So it should be okay to send them back to school. That's the thought process and a lot of push. But at the same time, you know, we have to take it in context with what's happening in, the, in our area, in our community. So if, if kids are doing okay, that's fine, but they're gonna come home and infect their parents or grandparents or other family members. And that is not fine. You know, that's there. There are teachers with the health conditions. So I worry about um, those issues and whether schools will be able to deal with that. Mm -hmm. um, and as you know, in, in California, where we live, um, sort of the decision was made by the governor. No, we're not going to open schools unless you get it, the virus under control in your community. And that's a great idea because that is a good marker to show that people are taking all the things seriously and it's under control. And right now we're not. And once we open schools, definitely we will increase spread, definitely. So there's no doubt about that. It's just a matter of how much it will increase and how, you know, how vastly it will affect kids. And uh, to me, it feels like a little bit of an experiment. We just got to know more. We need more data. You know, everything in this is, is happening too quickly. We're learning. We're literally learning every day. Something new is coming up. So just too much unknown. And I think that's exactly what Sabine and I, Dr. Sabine and I were just talking about how it's so important in the reopening of schools, um, you know, 100% physical presence, we need to rely on science and the role of science has to be, you know, it, it has to be really critical in reopening it because we, it's like you said, it's such an unknown and, uh, you know, you look at the surveys, all the parents are saying, take the kids back, open up the schools. And although the teachers <laughs> are saying, you know, we need to do it scientifically, we need to have data that we're all going to be safe. And that, you know, um, even though I'm not vulnerable, but my in-laws might be, and I live with them, or my family or my parents. And I think that's more of the concern that um, my teaching fraternity is having. Yes, yes. And, you know, some, I, I've read some data that, you know, one in four teachers is at risk uh, of severe disease if they get it. So that's, that's a big number. And kids don't live in a bubble when they go to school. They're going to be not, you know, the whole process. Yeah, you can have less number, you can do the distancing, you can have them use a mask and sanitizer. That all works when you have such low community spread, you have such low numbers, it might work. But when what's going on right now around, especially Orange County and California, it's very hard to believe that opening schools will decrease numbers. They will definitely increase numbers. And, you know, I'm very mindful of issues like parents have going back to work and, and so forth. Those are, it, this is a problem. It is, but 
I feel like there are other solutions uh, than just, you know, sort of opening schools without relying on science. I believe in science. I think we should let the process of science tell us a little bit more first. Mm -hmm. So what would be a safer way uh, to bring kids back to the classroom? What do you think? Um, what would be the, I mean, in the beginning, you know, we have to, I mean, it would be basically experimentation, you know, so what would, what could be a safer way? Mm, you know, for, I think I would say, and it, it is sort of um, agreed upon that the younger kids, the elementary school kids probably could go back to physical school with the distancing, with all the measures in place, hand sanitizers and hand washing and masks, if they can tolerate masks, because you know, very young kids cannot. So maybe that age group can be sort of started off first. And a lot of countries have done that, where they kept the elementary schools open and they did fine, most of them. But to me, it feels like nothing is going to be possible till we get the virus under control in our community. So it's about you know, when things shut down and we compare with, I, we always compare with other nations and when things shut down and when things came down, the level of the virus circulating in your community comes down. That's when you can start opening things up to normal. So right now, I, I don't want to say it's not possible. It's going to be difficult to open school even for a few days a week. And it's going to require such intense monitoring because we have to make sure less kids they are distant, you know, maybe they need plexiglass barriers, maybe the teacher needs to be behind a plexiglass barrier, that might be required, because you got to protect the teachers too, you know, that, that to me is as important, and you got to protect the kids, so, you know, maybe they can have an outdoor PE class, but, you know, indoor is, is going to be very, very difficult to accommodate, that's my um, assessment. So, um, yeah, so what would be the new normal for? What would, so after shutdown, what is our new normal? What are we looking at? <laughs> I think we're looking at it like uh, uh, when we, you know, you, when you go out now, you do probably, everybody is, is covered up and that is going to be a new normal for a while. You know, you're wearing your mask or wearing your mask and shield and all of that. And then just being mild, mindful about, you know, am I doing everything to keep my hands clean? Uh, you know, making sure you're not cross-contaminating, touching one surface and another surface, making sure as soon as you enter your home, the first thing you do is wash your hands. A lot of things will change. And I'm seeing, you know, some things are possible here, like outdoor di dining is a thing now. You know, that's become the new normal. Everything is outdoor. I've seen outdoor gyms, you know, which is, I don't think, sustainable long-term. But these, a lot of things will change. A lot of... Uh, Innovation does happen because people are under pressure to change things and to, you know, to move on. And, and I do feel bad for the businesses. They need to open. So the new normal might be a lot of outdoors and less indoors because we know that outdoors is less threat from this virus. You know, it's not likely to spread as much. And in indoor space, you know, we're definitely putting ourselves at risk. Which I think probably is easier here in California. The weather is not yeah. so as they're approaching, um, you know, a fall and winter. It's going to be cold outside, so um, we don't know how how much outdoor activities, you know, or outdoor business you can uh, carry on outside. Um, I have actually seen um, some facilities in Newport Beach. They're doing facials outside, um, which is, you know. <laughs> which was actually um, allowed, um, you know, and the governor, um, you know, gave the permission to do facials and haircuts outside. Um, um, I mean, we, we, we have that privilege of having beautiful weather, so probably it would be even nicer getting a facial outside with a <laughs> beach breeze, yeah. but, you know, people who are in other states probably yeah. it's going to be harder for them. Yeah. Yes, yeah. In California, Dr. Chahal, I mean, um, from Orange County to San Bernardino County, the weather is about 20 degrees hotter. So, yeah. you know, um, a lot of people are asking, are salons safe to go to? Even if they're outdoors, I don't think you can last very long, but you have sweat, you're sweating. And so at some point you're likely to feel suffocated and take off the mask because you're sitting outside. True. So are salons safe if we do follow that route and we go for the um, outdoor facials and, and whatever else see uh, okay so outdoor yes it's less risk because you're not you know even if you're coughing or sneezing it is dissipating the your particles so 
but you do need to do all the other measures. You do need to have your mask on and you do need to have some kind of barrier between the person, you know, doing the hair color, the facial and you either like one of those shields or something. Now, I, I think it's people are getting so impatient and they want this and that they want things to open. So we, we, you know, this is one way of doing this and decreasing risk, but nothing is zero risk. You know, there is still a risk, even if you're outdoors and you're sitting and getting a haircut for 20 minutes and talking to someone, um, you know, as long if you're not good about keeping a mask on, there is a risk. So nothing is going to be zero risk. It's just going to be, you're going to have to weigh, like, can I take this risk? Am I just be as long as you, you're aware that, you know, you really, really need this service or not. Um, and they're, they're trying, I think everybody wants things to be open. Everybody also wants, you know, this virus to be controlled. Both of those are somewhat possible if we follow all the guidelines. And those, those kind of got, you know, that, that became a little distraction where people just did not follow uh, the whole masking. They felt like this was not necessary. And I think if we adhere to that, we follow that, it is definitely possible to do a lot more and to open a lot more businesses. It is, you know, it, it can be done. Um, but nothing will be zero risk until, you know, eventually we find either a, a good vaccine or a cure for this. Yep, that brings us to the next question. So what about the vaccine? When are we getting a vaccine? <laughs> we, you know, that is, that makes me smile because I feel like it, it, I have never seen vaccine studies and vaccines being developed this quickly. You know, we, we always wait for a vaccine. It takes years, decades sometimes. And I am amazed at all the scientific work, you know, all the work being done. Everybody has pushed everything through and it is being done in the right way. I had, you know, I had my concerns too, and I've been reviewing and been on, you know, several panels and talks about how the research is being done and nothing's being, no corners are being cut. And now we have several vaccines in phase three, which basically means that it's being given to a lot of healthy people. So we have, uh, you know, a couple of vaccines out here in the U.S. Moderna vaccine, I think one and one by Pfizer, which is being studied. So thirty thousand volunteers are going to be getting it um, from now up till November, and then November they're going to study and see how everybody did. So it's a two-dose vaccine. You get one dose, and twenty-eight days later you get another dose. So uh, if that, you know, comes out as a good vaccine, we, are, we, we just might have something available for everybody you know, early next year, we just might. But this is being studied in um, you know, sort of healthy young adults right now. So we have not studied children, we have not studied the very elderly yet. So Senior. that will be later. Yeah, mm -hmm. seniors have not been included in this, but it is, I'm very hopeful. Mm -hmm. And it would be like a vast, and like the number of uh, patients, you know, it, should, it it needs to be available in like big quantities because, you know, that's like, even if you start with that vulnerable population, you it's there are like so many people, you know, to cover. So, yeah. yeah. So, I mean, by the time you're done vaccinating everybody, it probably would be like <laughs> mid-year, <laughs> next year, mid-year. You know. Yeah, and you know, uh, that's the other thing. There's been so much pre-production where vaccines are being produced. We don't know yet if they're going to work for sure, but uh, a lot of companies have just gone into, there's you know, several, like the Moderna vaccine is being produced, and then Oxford and AstraZeneca has a vaccine that is being produced, is being manufactured, so ready to go. So a lot of you know, innovation is there, and it, you know, this situation does push people into doing things well beyond their scope you where you feel like okay i did not have this in me but you go beyond and that is happening so i you know i'm hopeful we'll have enough doses and we'll have enough at least to start off by you know vaccinating a good good chunk of the population and getting this under control so i always get this question is the vaccine going to be like a flu vaccine like it will we would have to get it every year or is it going to be like one-time vaccine do we have enough data on it yet or not so we, we don't. We don't have that data about how frequently we'll need this vaccine. It looks like it will be a one-time. That's what it's looking like. Um, we are still studying what happens to the immunity when, when somebody does get this. Um, we are noticing now that their, their antibody levels go down in a few months. What does that mean? You know, when they get exposed again, will they get the infection again? So all that because we're right where people may be starting to get infected again. They've recovered from their first bout. So it's being studied and assessed, but 
so far all everything points to it should work with that you know one time and should not be like the flu vaccine but yes more more if i this uh, you know this year has been a lot of learning a lot of learning and a lot of quick learning and and it, it's like there are there are errors made and then you have to go back and kind of figure things out again and so forth but this everything is happening we call this in medicine we call this everything is happening in uh, corona time it's like double time you know, everything is going so fast and things are being uh, developed and i'm sure we'll have answers to that question soon enough too i have a question from someone um, and mm -hmm. they're asking why are the covid tests taking 10 days for the results to come and you know by the time you realize you have covid 10 days have elapsed and mm -hmm. uh, how can we change that or is that changing yeah that's that is a very big problem and that's basically just a matter of it's it's a jam lock of tests you know people so many people need the tests and so many people are getting tested labs are getting packed and impacted and that is why your test results are delayed. And it's a big problem. I think it is the biggest problem we have. You know, if somebody, yes, if somebody comes into the hospital and they're sick enough, we are able to get them a test right away and act on that. Because certain treatments are decided upon once we have a confirmation of your diagnosis. But out, you know, if you have somebody who's not sick enough and you tell them maybe you have COVID, now you got to stay home for 14 days, your test results will be back. And they keep waiting and they keep waiting you know, it's very hard. They they might need to go out and do groceries, or they might they have little kids. So I am I'm, I'm understanding that that issue, and I think California is doing a little bit better. Like there's there's a lot of more testing centers that are being provided, like the state, and even in the city of Irvine has one. So that is to decrease that that impaction on the lab and get your test results back quick. So, um, yeah, so we had this question, any updates on testing? So I know there is a nasal swab and then there is an mm -hmm. antibody test. Now there's a saliva test or the buccal swab. Um, I mean, um, how effective are those and, um, and which, uh, what are the indications for each of those? Uh, yeah, so so the the mainstay or the main test that we rely on is called the PCR test, which is done with a nasal swab. It can be an oral swab or a buccal swab. And now recently we have a self uh, done swab, which is called a mid nasal swab. So you don't, because the, the other nasal swab is very deep and it has to be done by a healthcare professional. So we have all of these um, modes and the test is called a PCR test and it detects the actual virus. So you have a virus at that moment in time or not in you. And then if you have symptoms, you have disease with that virus. Now the antibody tests only test if you have exposure to the virus. So if you, when you get exposed, you make antibodies and this detects that. Does not tell you if you have it right now or was it two months ago. So there's no differentiation there. So it is uh, mostly used in what we say prevalence studies to find out, you know, did you get coronavirus two months ago. A lot of people want to know, like in March, I was very sick. I never got tested. Can I know? Antibody tests for those. But if you're feeling like I'm sick right now, then the PCR test, which is the nasal swab or the oral swab, or sometimes they can even use sputum for that. So those are the types of uh, tests being used. And again, you know, testing also every time they're trying to bring out new tests and new platforms to decrease this congestion of testing. Mm -hmm. So um, at-home testing is available for patients? It, yeah, I, just, I think it's just coming out. So the FDA has just approved uh, some, and I think Quest Labs is probably going to be heading it where you know you get the kit in the mail and you do the test and you submit the sample. And supposedly that, you know, that will decrease the amount of like, you need the equipment, protective equipment for people to do the test. Uh, but I'm, uh, I'm still waiting to see if that will decrease the congestion and the turnaround time, because that's important too. So how do they do the, the mid nasal swab you were mentioning? Is it you, you just, you just kind of put it up your nose yourself, <laughs> the, the, the stick, yeah. And then you hand it over to the um, healthcare professional. No, then no, no, it's all done. So you 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 take you have a while. You're going to stick it in. So it's a, it requires a little. You know, you have to have a little bit dexterity and a little bit knowledge about. You open the little vial. You do your little swab. You stick it in. You close it and you mail it out or you drop it off at Quest. So it is. And there's some talk about you know doing it like uh, connecting with the lab like through a 
phone call and they guide you through it or some there is some talk about that uh, yeah. there there are there's a couple of other tests that that are trying to come out where you know they're to, just doing the oral swab and those are um, a whole different uh, genre of test that is also in in works but uh, we don't know if those tests are as reliable yet mm -hmm. yeah. So how about any uh, updates on the treatment? Um, you know, we know remdesivir and um, um, I think that's the main um, treatment right now uh, in hospitalized patients. Um, yeah, so that's, you, that's right. That's it? Nothing else? Uh, so yeah, no, uh, I'm sorry. I feel like I cut you off there. <laughs> uh, but uh, yeah, so most of the, of the hospitalized patients um, the, yeah, there's there's limited treatment, so it's it is pretty demoralizing. You know, you have to uh, sometimes just support them through. It's, you you it's not like you're doing nothing, but you're supporting them with oxygen and other therapies, so they get better on their own. We do have a good results with remdesivir so far. They're not amazing, I would say. It's not like a cure all where you give it and everything everything is fine. No, some people it works very well. It has to be given earlier. You know, it cannot be given to very, very sick patients on ventilators. It doesn't work as well. So there's other therapies like steroids you know, and other medications with, which alter your uh, inflammation response. So this virus is, is a very uh, unique in that way that it you know, kind of activates your own inflammation against you. And it's also associated with a lot of clotting. So we use uh, drugs to prevent that. So there's uh, a lot of modalities being used but specific antiviral treatments, we have very limited. And basically, we just have remdesivir, and you know, it is. It's um, um, we're hoping that something else will come out of the pipeline. So I have had few patients who wanted to donate plasma. I mean, and people had this question: if they have been infected, if they can go and donate plasma, um, and if that would be helpful for very sick patients. Is there enough data behind it? Yes, yes. So that's another therapy that um, is definitely being used. Um, I would say we don't, we, so it's based on the fact that you have antibodies against a disease, it should be helpful. Uh, data is still coming. We don't know for sure if it's as good as remdesivir or better or what. Uh, but so far, you know, it is, it is a sort of a, um, method we use when you know nothing else is available it's definitely recommended everybody should try to donate um, if they can uh, the red cross is you know waiting and we we do have shortages of plasma as well for con it's called convalescent plasma which is based from patients who have recovered so it is being used again i cannot say that it is you know amazing and it saves everybody but it seems to be helpful it's also being studied for you know, disease prevention. So that's also being uh, studied. But for now, um, we are, uh, everybody will welcome anybody who wants to donate it. So please tell your patients, uh, go ahead. I think you have to wait, like they have to wait about four weeks after their uh, uh, initial diagnosis to get assessed for that. So one more question. Um, if a patient is infected once, can the patient be reinfected? So that's a you know, good question because just recently we got some more uh, insight into this. So a lot of other countries have more knowledge on this. They've been dealing with this before us. And it seems like the answer is no so far. So it seems like once somebody gets infected and if they do uh, come back with you know, any kind of other symptom, uh, it's not really that serious. And it's thought to, thought to be like, maybe it's, it is post you know, what we call post COVID syndromes, you know, where your lungs are affected or something else, or sometimes your brain is affected, but in general, they're not getting the serious disease again. So that is not happening. Uh, but you will hear a lot and it's a lot in the news that they will test positive. So a lot of people will test positive with that PCR test, even up to three months after the diagnosis, but it doesn't mean that virus is active and replicating. It sort of is like, pieces of the virus left behind as uh, as we understand but mm -hmm. uh, yeah so far it is not looking like and you know this some this is something that will probably know more about six to seven to eight months in because you know in the u.s people started getting infected february march earliest other 
countries it happened earlier and so far from them we've seen that it, you know it's not seems it does not seem like a possibility so um you mentioned that the virus can stay longer and can the patient still transfer uh, you mentioned like for how long can this can this test stay positive um yeah so so no so the the virus can stay as in it can be detected in your right. system right but that when they take that virus and try to grow it and see if it's active and replicating it's not so it's just sort of you know, remnants of the, because the PCR test that I'm talking right. about, the one we do nasal swab, it detects any piece of the virus. So any little part of the virus that is left behind is detected, but it's not growing. And, you know, I have patients who come back three, four months later now, because it's almost from March, April is three, four months. They are still positive And immediately there was a lot of confusion and issues, you know, what do we do with them? They were, are they infected again? And so most recently we got uh, more guidance even from the CDC and uh, the answer is no you know they're once they're done with their disease they're done as long as they're about we're saying 20 days from the initial diagnosis you know then we don't consider them still infectious so if you if you have somebody who's got COVID and has recovered and they go to get tested they're still positive like a month later or two months later not to worry mm -hmm. so they won't be spreading it they can go and no, visit family? They can go and visit family. They just continue to wear the mask. Mm -hmm. I can't stress this mask more than anything else yeah. in every yeah. situation. It's, it, it is, it's, it's very helpful. Yeah. 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 So Nina, any other questions you have? You know, somebody had sent this earlier when we were talking about the vaccine. Are we going to have enough? Or are we going to run out of the vaccine when it is uh, approved? And oh, probably that's, that's, what, has, that's uh, what my guess is. <laughs> I, I think we will have enough. See, the vaccine will be given out in um, groups or phases. So they will start off with, you know, as I said, the study is going on in younger population anyway. So it'll probably be people who are like first responders, healthcare workers, you know, immunocompromised people. So it'll start off there and then eventually other people will get it. There is so much effort between this is one place where you know the government and the private industry have come together and there's so much effort to have enough vaccine because everybody knows that is the one thing that's going to get you know things going back again to normal so there is definitely a lot of input there from every direction so i am hopeful we'll have enough uh i don't think that's my main concern you know it's about it we should have enough it should be safe and then we should have enough people willing to take the vaccine also so you know all of those issues do come uh, to mind but uh, i would not worry about availability you know eventually everybody will get it okay right, so what are we looking in in um so Anina, i'm sorry <laughs> you know, so I, because you know i had this question which i wanted to ask and for sure because a lot of patients had this question for flu season, what are we looking at? Is it going to be the same? Is it going to be more intense? Um, how about the vaccine? Should patients get the vaccine? Um, I mean, it's just right there. Yeah, so, you know, it's a very good question again. Flu vaccine is always, always a good idea, even, even more important now. We don't want to confuse the two things. So if you get sick this flu season, we will not know, you know, you got the flu, you got COVID, it's going to be a mess for you and everybody else. So protect yourself, you know, everybody should get the flu vaccine. Uh, that is always, always, you know, a good idea. And it's totally safe to go get a flu vaccine. And that will not be a problem. And I just want to bring up, you know, something which also is more recently we're seeing, you know, as you know, Southern Hemisphere, like Australia and, and so forth, they have their flu season in their winter, which is our summer. And uh, supposedly because they were so good with their uh, distancing and mask wearing that their flu season was very mild. They barely had any flu. So all these measures that we're taking for coronavirus are gonna help us with the flu season as well. So, mm -hmm. you know, if people continue to do that, that and the vaccine, I think we might just see, you know, we're, 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 everybody's apprehensive it's gonna be so bad, but we might just see that the flu cases also go down. Mm -hmm. Well, we're ending on a positive note then. I'm happy yeah. that we've got a vaccine coming. We have things to look forward to. 
And in, in, in this day and, and time, what we need is good news. So um, with that, I'm going to ask Dr. Muneeb to share some um, tips to keep mentally healthy. Should we do more of yoga and deep breathing? What do you both recommend? I'll, I'll throw out the question to both of you. Since Dr. Chahal is talking already, why, you share your tips. What do you do yourself? If anybody oh. needs sanity right now, it's you. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's a, you know, I, I, I wish I had like you know, specifics just to say that this is, but um, you're, you're so right. It's, yeah, you can do a lot of, uh, you just have to come up with your own plan. Like you have to come up with either meditation, yoga, breathing, or just, you know, you're, you're taking that walk by yourself. But in the, at the end of the day, you know, you need good support, uh, definitely. And we have to realize everybody's in this together. So I always remind myself when I'm feeling like, oh my God, this is such a horrible day. And then I think, you know, what people are suffering more than me. So always remind yourself, always be grateful. That's, that's the one thing that's keeping me going. Like, okay, I'm healthy, I'm fine. And I have resources to stay home. I have a house, I have food to eat. So things are good, but uh, definitely check with your friends check with each other and I think uh, um, probably uh, Dr. Muneeb can tell us more <laughs> on yeah. that note. Well we did like a whole section on it um, I think <laughs> yeah. a few months ago for the mental oh, health okay. thing yeah because you know it's more um, even I was talking to Dr. Shahal last night when we were talking about like um, this um, con and the talk we are having t today so um, there are more reported um, suicides and um, there are increased reported depression. Uh, mental health is a big thing right now. Um, and I think uh, we, we, we will do another update on that. Um, I mean, I was busy, a little bit busy with, you know, just with this and a few other things at work, but I think we should do another session because, and definitely it's more than 20% rise in um, uh, depression and anxiety or, you know, substance abuse. So, um, and then, you know, the one tip I would just for sure uh, share here is that, you know, if you are experiencing any symptoms of depression, we call it anhedonia, loss of interest in your daily activities, problem sleeping, you know, talk to your healthcare providers. Don't, don't hesitate. You, nobody's going to put you on medicine. People are scared. Oh, we'll talk to a doctor and they will put us on medication. No, it's about, I mean, I have patients who, who are not on medication, they're talking to psychologists. I just tell them, why don't you message me, a text message or send me an email every other day and let me know how you're feeling. Or if they're not letting me know, then I will check on them. Um, it is very important. You, you have to be very, uh, you have to take that initiative as a healthcare provider too and as a patient too, you know. Um, we all understand this, these are not normal circumstances. We are not, this is not a normal time. Um, I tell all my patients, we are dealing with COVID brain, you know, we all have that COVID brain right now. So, you know, it's, um, if you're not thinking right, if, you know, you have suicidal thoughts, or if you are like, if this is not never going to end, you know, all those kind of things need to be shared with your um, family or healthcare provider. If you're not comfortable with friends and family, then share it with your healthcare providers. Um, we know we are here, we are all working that extra mile for you. So we will make sure that you get help. And we spoke about it last time. Um, we have some resources on our website, Suicide Prevention Line, Domestic Violence. All of those resources are on our web, on website and we are there, we keep on checking and Eli's all the time on the website, <laughs> checking messages. So even if I'm not able to get hold of, she will get hold of me. So um, please, please, please don't, um, don't hesitate. Um, this is very important. Um, mental health is important. Um, yes, the physical health and corona prevention, all of that is uh, a different part of disease, but the mental aspect is also different. Um, there was a study published in India where um, they noticed some uh, neurocognitive and definite deficits in patients who were in the beginning when patients were recovering from coronavirus. So neurocognitive deficits mean um, memory issues or depression or, you know, some, some psych, psych, psychiatric issues as well. 
So, um, but I mean, it is so new to us, we don't know exactly, you know, how it is affecting, but there are some effects, which probably would be um, noted down, down in the history, you know. <laughs> Um, so yeah, so please, 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 you know, pay attention to that. Uh, exercise is very important. Deep breathing, mindfulness, all of that is important, but exercise alone is very important. So that if that probably is the only way you can relax these days, you know, um, besides, you know, talking to family or, you know, reading some positive, um, you know, um, uh, literature or you know positive blogs if there are any um, and don't um, watch CNN all the time I do like CNN <laughs> and Fox but please <laughs> don't, don't it shouldn't be running 24 hours in your kitchen while you're working definitely it's gonna make you anxious so um, you want to check some updates go on website on CDC or you know even uh, CNN just you know get the update and you know go ahead change the channel Watch something else. So, you know, if you're constantly in that loop, you will get anxious. So, um, I mean, those are the brief tips because, you know, this is our, nor this is our new norm now. Um, so how, I mean, we have to live with it. So if it's constantly on our mind, it's constantly on, on our brain, you know, it can affect us mentally. Thank you, uh, Dr. Muneeb, and thank you, Dr. Puneet Chahal. It was uh, an honor to have both of you. You are serving our communities, risking your lives. God bless you. And um, I, all I can do is say that let's all take a deep breath and let's all smile at each other more. And then, you know, just get out there and get one with nature. I think COVID has given us an opportunity to go back to this, the, the cities that we live in and discover those um, you know, the trails that we have and the lakes that we have and, and you know, be thankful, like you said, Dr. Chahal. So that's one of the ways that I coped with COVID. I just went out and I said, okay, I'm going to walk. And I realized, oh my gosh, I didn't know this existed in my city. So um, we're all thankful um, to have you and your expertise. And with that, um, we end our discussion. Thank you so much for your service and God bless. Thank you, Nina. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Thank you so much.